Today, uh, today's a big Sunday. You know, we're, we're starting a new series. Um, my wife worked an overnight shift last night, so me and Ev fell asleep watching Star Wars Episode Three. So I'm pumped. Um, that really inspired me. You know, no sermon prep. I just watched that movie, and out of the abundance of that, I'm going to... That's not true. Let me go ahead and pray for us, since we're on the beginning of a, um, a series. Father, um, we are so totally dependent on you in ways that, that I, I think, w- personally speaking, I just have no idea how true that actually is. Uh, I've done everything that I can to try to make this teaching make sense. Um, but there isn't a thing that we can do to provide any real transformation if you don't move and you don't breathe all over this. And so that's what I'm asking you for, God, that for the next 12 weeks of this series that we've called Equip, that you would take what we have done and you would do what only you can do, that you would breathe on this, that you would manifest yourself through this, that you would make yourself real uh, to the men and the women that tune into this both in person and online, and that ultimately it would just lead people to the feet of Jesus. That's where we need to be over and over again, and it's in the name of Jesus we ask these things. And God's people said, amen. So last week, if you were here, uh, last week was the big one. That's Easter. That's the, the kind of day on, on, uh, um, on a church's calendar that uh, we, we pay as, as much special attention and give as much focus to uh, what Jesus did to make salvation freely available to us. Today, uh, we are starting a brand new series that really focuses on practices that you and I can do and are called to do in order to make sure that the grace Jesus has made freely available to us continually transforms absolutely every area of our lives. And those practices, as indicated behind me, have historically been called spiritual disciplines, Um, And so before I get into it, I just want to make sure that I'm as clear as possible. I really can't overestimate the importance of what I'm about to say. This series is not about what you need to do in order to be saved. This series is about what you need to do in order to continually grow as somebody who has already been saved by grace through faith in the name of Jesus. So let let me kind of take a moment here to just set the tone of, of, I guess, sort of what you should expect. We're going to be here for about 12 weeks is what it looks like. And uh, just looking at various practices that for the last 2,000 years have been an integral part of the lives of, of the men and women who have followed Jesus that have led uh, to their progressive transformation throughout their life. And so, you know, some of the messages that I give, the aim of them maybe not the aim of them, but the feel of them is more, you know, moving and emotional. Uh, even last week, I, I heard some sniffles in the crowd. I actually had a few sniffles myself, and I was telling that story about my son at the end. We're not going to talk about that right now, though. Um, some, some other messages that I've given, you know, have, their, their feel has kind of been, you know, more maybe motivational or, or you know, the goal would be to, to, to be inspirational. And I just want to let you know that that's really, something in between those two is what this series is all about. My... my My goal in this series with these spiritual disciplines is just to take them off the shelf and put them into your hands so that you can grow as a follower of Jesus and so that the image of Christ can be formed more clearly in you. That is the stated goal behind everything that we do for the next 12 weeks. And maybe it's the stated goal behind everything that we do all the time, but specifically for this series. And, And if you're new to this church, cool time to be here because I've actually never done a series so solely devoted to just this. And so, um, I I gotta be honest with you, I have made an assumption about you this morning, and I think it's only fair that I be forthright about that and let you know what that is. The assumption that I made about you in showing up here, either in person or through that camera, which is still weird for me to say and think about, is that you are here because you actually desire to grow. And so this teaching and and this series, at times at least, is probably going to feel a little bit like a lecture lab. I just want you to know the assumption behind everything that's said is the assumption that you're here because you actually desire to grow. So that leads to the question, how do you grow? Really what we're asking is, what are the spiritual disciplines? Uh, Historically, God's people um, have, have looked for the spiritual disciplines and found them probably... Uh, in the book of Psalms, I would say probably more than any other book in the Bible. Psalms will show you, they'll not just tell you what they are, they'll show you how the spiritual disciplines work. And so that's where we're going to camp out for this series predominantly. And so um, today, 
uh, as we start this series, looking at our very first spiritual discipline, we are very appropriately going to find it in the very first psalm. So let me read Psalm chapter 1 to you. It says this. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Version of the Bible. How happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or join a group of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He's like a tree planted beside streams of water that bears its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not survive the judgment, and sinners will not be in the community of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. This is God's word. Now, first off, the the claim, and and really it's the promise that this psalm makes, um, is is unreal. My version, the Holman Christian, begins with, with the word happy, uh, but you're probably used to hearing this, this, um, uh, this chapter in a different version where almost every other version besides mine will start it with the word blessed. Blessed is the man who doesn't do all these things. In the Hebrew, that word carries a lot more weight than the English translation of it. You know, you hear happy, that has the connotation of a very fleeting kind of superficial feeling. But um, the Hebrew word behind it actually refers to something that, that's more akin to, to total satisfaction and fulfillment um, and complete well-being, which is something that I don't care where you're coming from, all of us want more of that. So the question is, okay, who, who gets that? Who gets to claim that? Or what do you have to do to become the type of person that inherits that? And, and the promise here is that the person who inherits that is the person who learns to meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. And, and so just to, to, to summarize this kind of succinctly, the promise of Psalm 1 is that total fulfillment and complete well-being will be yours if you learn the spiritual discipline of meditation. Now, given the gravity of that, uh, that certainly should cause us to lean in and try to figure out what meditation actually is because that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Chances are something already popped into your mind when you hear that word. So that's what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to look at this from four angles. I want to look at, uh, first off, the promise of meditation. Secondly, the principle of meditation. Thirdly, the practice of meditation. And then lastly, the puzzle of meditation. All peas. All all peace. So with that, let me get to the first idea today. It's going to be the first idea of the series. Number one, the promise of meditation. It's found in verses three and four. Let me read it again. It says, he, this person who learns how to meditate on the law of the Lord, he is like a tree planted beside streams of water that bears its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Verse four, the wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. There's actually three things in just those two verses that are promised to to a person who learns this discipline. First off, what we're told is that if you, I'll make it personal, if you learn the spiritual discipline of meditation, you will become a person of substance rather than a person of hollowness. Uh, Because, the psalmist says, a person who learns to meditate is gonna become like a tree rather than like chaff. Now, most of us, Living in in 2021, you're probably not familiar with what chaff is, though I know some of us are. Chaff is is the basically the the husk or the 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 dry, dead, lifeless covering of the seed. In the winnowing process, the seed would fall, seed would fall to the ground, and the chaff, which was completely useless beyond that, would be basically this, this superficial kind of hollow covering that served no purpose, it could produce no life, and it would either be blown away or 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 simply burn. That was it. And so the the teaching of of this text here, the meaning of this is essentially um, that there's a certain superficial hollowness to the human heart. That's what this is getting across. This is true of every single one of us, that we all put up, you know, fronts. We all put on a mask either in social media or in our social interactions with other people because we want to be thought of in certain ways. Uh, We want to think of ourselves in certain ways. But the the plain fact of the matter is that there is almost never total congruency between the front that you put up 
for others and the person that you actually are underneath. You know, we all want to be thought of, of as people that are very confident, people that are very insightful, uh, people that are strong, people that are put together, people that are, you know, emotionally healthy, all these kinds of things, when underneath that facade or that mask that we put on for other people, we're a mess. And we have all kinds of, of inadequacies and all kinds of fears and all kinds of insecurities swirling around our heart at any given moment. It's just a question of how, basically how we're trying to compensate for that. Even people who say, a lot of times we hear people today say, you know, I'm not like that. I'm authentic. I keep it real. Right? Everybody wants to think of themselves as the exception to that. The question you got to ask yourself is, is that really true of you or is that just what you want other people to think about you? Because according to scripture, there is a natural superficial hollowness to all of us. And according to Psalm chapter 1, the solution to that and, and the key to becoming a, person's, a, a person of genuine substance is learning the spiritual discipline of meditation. That's the first promise. The second promise is that the person who learns this discipline is going to become a person of stability rather than someone who is controlled by and blown around by the things that go on around them. Because if you follow this metaphor, the psalmist says that the chaff is blown away by the wind, whereas the person who learns how to meditate is going to become like a tree that is planted, a tree that is rooted. But significantly enough, this psalm says not only will you become like a tree that's rooted, you'll become a tree that is rooted by streams of water. And that's a very important detail. Because any, any tree that's rooted in the ground, it's true that, that it's not going to be blown about by the wind. But if a tree is simply rooted in the ground, it still is, is in every way dependent on what happens around it. You know, no matter how rooted a tree is in the ground, if, the, if a drought extends long enough, that tree's going to die because it's dependent on weather patterns for its own health. But a tree that's planted by a stream is no longer dependent by what's going on around it. And so what Psalm chapter 1 is promising you is that Meditation uh, is the discipline that will give you access to something that will make you absolutely stable by freeing you from being controlled by what's going on around you. I've heard it said that meditation will get you into contact with the kind of water that will be there when every other kind of water in your life dries up. Total stability. That's a pretty good promise. The third one and the last one we're going to look at uh, we learn here that a promise who learns this discipline will also become not only a person of substance or a person of stability, but a person of sustained growth. Now, when you first read this psalm, no matter what version you read it in, admittedly, it looks like it, it's, it's offering, you know, an unrealistic promise. It looks almost like it's saying, if you master this technique called meditation, then you're going to have a really easy life. I mean, verse 3 even says that whatever this person does is going to prosper. So, you know, you take that at face value and it seems like, all right, all you got to learn is, is how to push the button known as meditation and you're going to have, you know, your whole life is going to go exactly the way that you want it to. But if you study verse 3 very carefully where it talks about prospering, the promise there is not, it's not that you will prosper generally. The promise is that you will prosper exactly like a tree that has been planted near a stream. So think about what that means for a second. Like we just said, a tree near a stream is a tree that will not die. That's why the psalmist says that its, you know, its leaf will not wither. However, the psalm says that this tree will still only bear fruit in its season. Now what that means is that through the discipline of meditation, you will become like a tree that will never die. However, you will still only bear fruit in season. And with that, what that means is that you should also expect, this is going to be a regular part of your life, you should also expect, even if you're regularly practicing the discipline of meditation, uh, regular seasons of fruitlessness in your life. And this is where the really realistic nature of Psalm chapter 1 comes into play. When you talk about what's a fruitless season in somebody's life, you know, fruitlessness is, is I'm sure, what, what we're all experiencing right now, you know, in one area of our life to some degree. You know, to be fruitless means that you're not seeing the health and growth and life and change and progress in you as quickly as you'd like to. You know, to be fruitless means that your prayers aren't being answered exactly the way that you want them to be answered. Uh, to be fruitless means that you're not seeing the realization of the things that you've worked very hard for, even though you haven't done anything wrong. It means that there's going to be times in your life where you, you, know, you suffer from feeling like 
you know, you're not quite sure who you are or how you fit or what your purpose is or whether or not you're useful. Fruitless seasons can mean all kinds of things. And, and you know, the, the bottom line is no, all of them are bad. None of them are comfortable. But the point of this psalm is that even though a tree does not always have fruit hanging from its limbs, that fruit is always growing even when you can't see it. That even in, even in the off season, even in the wintertime, that, fruit is, that, that tree is getting thicker that, tr- that, that, tr- that uh, tree's roots are going deeper so that when fruit-bearing season comes back around, the fruit that you will bear will be even better than the fruit that you bore the season before. And so the promise of this, of this psalm right here, I think this is breathtaking when you take any time to think about it. The promise is not that if you learn how to meditate, you'll never go through any difficult situations. The promise is that you will grow through everything you go through. It's an amazing thing to think about. And so, here's the, pro- here's the promise of meditation, that if you incorporate this discipline in your life and practice this discipline, make it a regular part of the rhythm of your existence, you will become, this is a promise you can hold God to, you will become a person of substance, a person of stability, and a person of sustained growth. So, all that to say, if you enjoy being superficial and unstable and you hate growing, you should leave now. But if any of those things sound appealing to you, then let's ask the question, okay, what exactly is meditation? And to answer that, we're going to enter into kind of our second move during our time together. Let's look at, secondly, the principle of meditation. We looked at its promise, now we're going to look at its principle. Even the location of this psalm, you know, Psalm chapter 1, the beginning of of the psalm book, even the location of this psalm tells us something uh, that's so, I, I think, misunderstood about the primacy, the importance of the spiritual discipline of meditation. Because if you, if you spend any time in the Psalms, what you probably picked up on very quickly is that the Psalm, one of the things that makes the entire Psalm book or the Psalter unique is that it is simply a book that's a collection of prayers. If you read through the Psalm, you will see, um, you will see Psalms that deal with every situation that, that you can enter into as a human Uh, you'll see Psalms dealing with every thought, every feeling, every emotion that you will experience between now and the day that God calls you home, all processed in prayer. But what's so interesting about Psalm chapter 1 that we're looking at today is that Psalm chapter 1 is not a prayer. It's a teaching about the discipline of meditation. And it was placed here as the introduction to Psalms intentionally. So what you have at the, at the very introduction of a book that's all about prayer, what you have is a teaching about the importance of meditation. And if you just zoom out from that for a second, you realize that even the placement of Psalm chapter 1, the reason that it's here is to teach us that we don't even really know how to pray until we meditate. I, I, I'm sure that this is going to resonate with somebody even if you know, nobody's really comfortable saying this out loud, but I've talked to a number of people who just can't figure out prayer. And I would say for, not that I have it figured out, but for most of my life, I really did have no idea what this is about. And I, you know, in in their more honest moments, maybe you've thought this, maybe you've heard somebody say this. I think a lot of people just wonder, what is prayer about? Why doesn't it work? I'm supposed to tell this God that I can't see the things that I want. I almost never get those things. What is prayer supposed to be about? The placement of Psalm chapter one is here to remind you and I that we shouldn't expect Expect to have a robust prayer life until we learn the spiritual discipline of meditation. In fact, I'm going to say something even more forceful than that. If you learn how to meditate, you will learn how to pray in a way that changes your entire life. Let that sit for a second. Generally speaking, there's, 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 I, think you can, I think it's fair to lump all kinds of prayer into two categories. You have calling prayer and you have answering prayer. Calling prayer is what we think of when we think about prayer because it's what we, it's the kind of prayer we most naturally practice, right? Calling prayer is prayer in which you begin the conversation with God based on some felt need or some thought in your life. You know, this is prayer that sounds like, God, um, I need you to come through for me with this job. I need this job and I need you to make sure that I get this job. God, I'm in this really difficult situation with this person. I need you to move here and, you know, help me say what needs to be said and them to hear what needs to be heard. Uh, God, I need you to to fix this relationship that I'm in. It's falling apart at the seams. I don't know what to do about it. I think I might be the problem. Would you change me? Uh, God, I need you to manifest your your, your presence to me, all that kind of stuff. That's a a calling prayer. Uh, 
Now, let me be really clear here because I, it's, it's very important to me that you hear me say this. There is nothing wrong with calling prayer. There are passages in Scripture that command us to practice calling prayer. However, the clear teaching of Psalm chapter 1 is that answering prayer rather than calling prayer is the type of prayer that is going to grow you and I much more quickly and much more deeply. And, and really, that's what meditation is. It's answering prayer. So what is answering prayer? You probably picked up on this. Answering prayer is prayer in response to what God has already said in his word, in response to the conversation God started here. This is prayer that allows God um, to tell me what we're going to talk about. It, it, it's, it's prayer that allows God to choose the subject, to set the tone, and I'm simply praying in response to the conversation that he already started. That kind of prayer uh, will take, take you and I in toward God, and in doing so, it'll help us to understand him more, It'll help us understand ourselves more. It'll help us understand the world as he's designed it more. And so naturally, that kind of prayer is going to grow us much more quickly. And that's essentially what Psalm chapter 1 is about. And so when you talk about the discipline of meditation, it's, it's even in here. Med meditation is about thinking about the law of the Lord. It's about reflecting and dwelling on what God has said in his word and allowing what God has said in his word to inform the basis of your prayer life. So for instance... If, if in response, for instance, when God says something about himself, when he reveals something about himself in his word, and I, and I adore and I worship and I praise him in response to what he has said he's like rather than what I think he's like, or, or if when God says something incredibly convicting about sin in his word, and, and I, I cause that, or I allow that to cause me to introspect into my own life, and begin searching how that sin might be manifesting itself in my own life. And I confess and I repent on the basis of what he has said my sin is rather than what I think my sin is. Or, or, or if when God makes a promise in his word, you'll see all kinds of promises made by God in just the Psalms. If when God makes a promise in his word, I ask him on the basis of that, to, to receive that promise or to believe more deeply and in a life-changing way that that promise is mine, and I allow what he's actually promised to inform that prayer rather than just some strong desires I find in my heart, then obviously that kind of prayer is going to change me. It's going to grow me much more quickly than the other kind. That's what the spiritual discipline of meditation is about. It's about sitting on and reflecting on what God has said in his word until I have a real sense of what he's, that he's actually speaking to me in his word and then praying in response to that. So it... <clears throat> A couple of months ago, it was actually about the middle of October, we had a little volunteer meeting here on a Wednesday night with um, a number of the volunteers. And, um, and it, we had that meeting right before we opened, back, opened the building back up for, for in-person gatherings. And I remember that night, uh, I was up here, I was just kind of opening up about what, you know, I feel like God had been revealing to me or doing in me through quarantine. And I actually told the volunteers that night, which is something I was kind of surprised to hear myself say, I actually said the words, I feel like I learned how to pray in quarantine. And, and what I meant that night is exactly what we're talking about here. It's not that I never practiced calling prayer before in my life. I don't think anybody really needs to teach us to do that. We've been doing that since we were children, you know, calling for our parents. It was answering prayer that I feel like certainly haven't mastered, but I've begun dipping my, my kind of my, my foot into that water. And so here, just to open up to you, this is what my time with God has looked like for basically the vast majority of my life until fairly recently. And maybe this is going to sound familiar to some of you. What I would do is I would spend, you know, X amount of time in a passage of Scripture, and, you know, hopefully I kind of got a read on what that's talking about. You know, maybe I didn't, you know, maybe I left kind of confused, but, but the point is, when I was done with that portion of my time with God, I would just kind of pivot, and then I would begin praying through my prayer list, you know, my wants and, and my desires and all that kind of stuff. And again, let me just say, I need to be clear here, there's nothing morally wrong with that, but to use the image that you see in Psalm chapter 1, that's a little bit like a tree being planted by a stream and looking at the stream and saying, man, that water looks incredible, and then not sending its roots down into the stream. And so meditation is the act through which you and I are sending the roots of our hearts into the life-giving stream of God's word. And so meditation, it's a difficult thing to, to define or put handles on, but it's important to know what meditation is not. Meditation is not just pure Bible study. 
But meditation is also not just praying through your prayer list. Meditation is almost like the bridge between two of them that sort of overlaps over both of them. And if you're like me, you're probably wondering, well, what does that look like? And there's probably the clearest picture of what meditation looks like is found actually in a psalm. It's Psalm chapter 103, where the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then it goes on to list what those benefits are. Now, if you read that psalm, what's clear, the psalmist is not talking to God because he's not even ready to talk to God. He hasn't prepared his heart to talk to God. So so he's not talking to God. He's also not talking to the people around him. He's talking to his own heart, to the core of his own being, to his own soul. And what he's basically doing is he's taking the truth of what God has said in his word, what God says is true about him, what God has already done for him, and he's applying that truth to his heart until it begins to change his heart. That's what meditation is. George Mueller, who did an insane amount of things for the kingdom of God, was actually famous, uh, famously quoted as saying, he, he got so many orphanages off the ground, did so much earthly good, but he was quoted as saying that the first great primary work Uh, the first business that he devoted himself to at the beginning of every single morning, he called it getting my soul happy in the Lord. That's what meditation is about. It's where you're grabbing a hold of your own heart and you're basically force feeding it the truth of God's word until it begins to really burn within you. It's almost like you're getting outside of your own soul and you're saying, listen, if this is what God has done for you, if what you're reading here is true about you, then how much different should your life look? And you do that over and over until it starts to actually burn in you. So that's the, that's the principle of meditation. But thirdly, I said I was going to get, get you know, as practical as possible here. So thirdly, I'm going to talk about number three, the practice of meditation. How do you actually do this? All right, the imagery that, that this psalm leaves us with is that of a tree that is sending its roots down into a stream and drawing that water up for its own, you know, sustenance. Um, and so what we learn in Psalm chapter 1 is, is really kind of three different um, practices that need to inform the way that we meditate. First off, we learn what we should draw on, how we draw on it, and then number three, we learn when we should draw on it. So so first off, when you talk about the spiritual discipline of meditation, what is it that you and I should actually be drawing on? And the answer, according to this psalm, could not be any more clear. We draw on the law of the Lord. Now, let me ask you a question. Why does this psalm talk about meditating on, why does it specifically use the phrase, the law of the Lord? Why not just scripture or the word of God? Uh, There's a very specific reason for that. In the Bible, whenever you see scripture referred to as the law, That's a phrase that's meant to get across to us the idea of the absolute authority of God's word for God's people. So so here's what that means. Christians are people who understand and accept that the Bible is not suggestions offered to you by your consultant. It is commands issued to you by your king. That is probably one of the most offensive things you can tell people in our hyper-individualistic culture today, but I didn't make it up. It's right here. Don't get mad at me. The, The teaching of this psalm is that Scripture will never move, Scripture will never move from, from, from being just pretty words on dead paper to a vehicle through which you have an encounter with the living God until you accept its absolute authority in your life. That's what Psalm 1 is saying. Now, maybe you ask the question, why is that? Why is that so necessary? And I actually think it's very easy to to answer that question. It is unrealistic for you to expect Scripture to have the power to pick you up if you've not given it the power to knock you down. That's why. Uh, Some of you may have heard this before. Thomas Jefferson uh, very famously created his own version of the Bible. I don't know if you, some of you have heard this before. Thomas Jefferson apparently took a pen knife and he carved out every single verse of Scripture that he didn't like. The stuff that he thought, ah, oh, that doesn't make sense. Somebody probably added that later. This offends me. I don't agree with this. I don't think God's like that. And what he was left with was the Thomas Jefferson version of the Bible. But here's, here's what's important to understand. In doing that, Thomas Jefferson did not simply create his own version of the Bible. He created his own God is what he did. He created a God that never challenged him, a God that never contradicted him, a God that never did or said anything that he didn't agree with, right? 
The only problem with that God is it's not the real one. And although, you know, I think most people would hear that and think that's ridiculous, I think what you would agree with is that there's a whole lot of people today that read the Bible exactly like that. There's a whole lot of people today, even people who claim to be Christians who read the Bible exactly like that. And maybe if you and I got really honest with ourselves and searched our own hearts, we would find a tendency in ourselves to read the Bible like that. You know, because of our cultural conditioning, because of the times and the places um, that, that God has seen fit to, to allow us to grow up in, there's always going to be passages of Scripture that we come across that just grate against us. And we think, that can't be right. That's too offensive. You know, that, we just haven't interpreted that correctly. This, maybe this got added on later, and, you know, I, that's so primitive. We're modern people. This is 2021. We just need to get rid of that. And if that's how you read it, fine. But what you need to accept when you, when you approach Scripture that way is what you're doing is you're creating a God who cannot knock you down. And a God who can't knock you down is also a God who can't pick you up. If you will not submit to his authority when, his say, when he says something that you don't like, he's not going to be able to pick you up when he says something that you need to hear. When you feel worthless, when you feel guilty, when you feel condemned, when you feel hopeless. That's why John actually said in 1 John that we have a God, we need a God who is greater than our hearts when our hearts condemn us. And so the teaching of Psalm chapter 1, first and foremost, is that if you and I want to have a life-changing encounter with God, we need to accept his word as law. That's what we draw on. Number two, we see how we draw on this. So the, the imagery here, like, like I mentioned, we're, we're, we're shown a tree that, that is sending its roots down into a stream and drawing that water up into itself. This might sound like a strange question, but if, if you think about it this way. So in one end of this tree, you have, you have water coming in the roots. Let me ask the question, what comes out the other end? And the answer is fruit. Water comes in from the roots, and it manifests itself as, as fruit in that tree's life, if you will. And so the idea here is that meditation, the spiritual discipline of meditation, is about making the word, causing the word to bear fruit in your own life. This is both, uh, it actually has to be both an intellectual thing and an emotional thing. And one of those is going to be harder than the other one for you, probably, you know, based on your temperament. And so intellectually, meditation means you sit on a passage of scripture and you're actively asking yourself, Okay, what, what would, it, it, given the truth that I'm faced with here, what would this look like if it was manifesting itself in my life? What would this look like in my marriage? What would this look like in my relationships at work? What would it look like if this truth from Scripture manifested itself as fruit in my life? But, but in doing that, like I mentioned, this is not just an intellectual thing. This is also an emotional thing. It means that when we come across passages of Scripture, we should be reasoning and actually arguing with our own hearts. And we should be telling our hearts, uh, heart, you know, oh my soul, to quote the psalmist, you should be arguing with the core of your being, this is who God has said he is. This is how much God has said he loves you. This is what God has promised he's done for you. This is what God says is true about you right now because of your adoption into his family. You now relate to him as a child to a father. If that's true, how might, why are you anxious about anything? Why do you care what other people have to say about you? Why are, why are you constantly getting offended at the way that you think people disrespect you if you have this kind of access to the one whose opinion ultimately matters? The creator of the universe looks down on you in love. Oh, my soul, don't you get this? That's what meditation is. And you do that in an intellectual sense, in an emotional sense, until it becomes real and begins to bear fruit in your life. Now, the, the, the book that, that has taught, and I want to be careful here, I'm not good at this. I feel like I have just started to do this, and, 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 and I've talked to the staff about it. I've talked to some of my closest friends about it. It has revolutionized my time with God, and the book that has probably been the most instrumental in teaching me how to do this uh, is called The Songs of Jesus by an author named Tim Keller that you hear me talk about all the time. The Songs of Jesus is a year-long devotional through the, the, the whole Psalter, and through this book, which I found out Keller wrote this just based on principles that he got from Martin Luther, which proves that there really is nothing new under the sun. But he said, as you read Psalms, if you want to, you know, teach your heart to get beneath the surface of it, just keep three words in mind. And I'd encourage everybody to do this. It has been super helpful for me. Just keep three words in mind as you slowly read through a Psalm or any passage of Scripture. The words are adore, admit, and aspire. Adore, admit, and aspire. 
And what that means is as you're reading through Psalms, the first question that I ask is, okay, what does this say about God that should cause me to adore him, to worship him, to praise him, to exalt him more in my life? And with that, what does this truth reveal about me that I need to admit, which is never comfortable, and then lastly, the aspire part is where I ask God. It, it's about what should I be asking God to see in my life based on what he said in his word. And so here's kind of the lecture lab portion of this teaching. Uh, let's get as practical as I ever get up here and do, you know, kind of like a, um, basically a, a practice meditation of, of Psalm 1. Here's what this would look like for Psalm 1. First off, when you talk about, you, you know, the adore aspect of digging into a text, what, what Psalm 1 tells you and I about God, amazingly enough, is that we have a God who communicates. Meaning we do not have a God who has given us the silent treatment and has left us to meander through life hoping that we're doing it the way that he wants us to do it, only to find out at the end of our lives that we got it wrong. We have a God who has communicated everything that we need to do in order to be the people that he's called us to be. And even more than that, Psalm 1 tells us that God's communication is not meant to shame us. It's not meant to condemn us. It's meant to delight us, that we would actually find life in it. That, tells us, uh, that has amazing implications for who God is, all of which that should cause us to adore him. But of course, with that, Psalm 1 forces me to admit that if that's true, that I'm a whole lot lazier than I like to admit. Because there's a whole lot of times in my life when I have allowed other priorities, other responsibilities to crowd out the time that I should have simply sat and stilled myself before my creator and listened to what he has had to say before I try to do anything. And when you talk about a tree sending its roots into a life-giving stream because it knows that that's where it's going to find that which will bring it to life and sustain its life, what that leads me to is, is, is to think about all of, the, all of the times, all the situations that I've looked for life outside of God and how much destruction and how much drought and how much, how much turmoil that's led to in my life. I'll think about that sometimes, and it'll just, it, like I'll go for, for, I'll wake up in an hour's seems like it, it, it's gone. And I'm thinking about all these ways and how the root causes so much pain in my life, so much suffering in my life, all of it because I've refused to put my roots into what God says is right in front of me. I mean, that, that's a, that can be a really painful thing to face about yourself. But lastly, you know, the aspire part of a psalm like this is where, you know, I would be asking myself and, and we can ask ourselves on the basis of what God has said, God, would you make me more like a tree instead of chaff? Because I still see way too much chaff in me. God, would you make me like a tree that's planted beside streams of waters? Would you make me a person of substance so that, that 50 years from now, when people ask my children, what was it like to be raised by Pastor Ryan? My son Everett would be able to say, the person that he was on stage on Sunday was the person he was behind closed doors. God, would you make me that kind of follower of Jesus? And would you make me a person of stability that I would stop being so moved, I would stop being so defined by what's going on around me or what, you know, the, the, the opinions of other people or the criticism of other people, that I would be so rooted in who you say I am and who you've revealed yourself to be that no matter how, how strong the winds blow around me, I stay steadfast rooted in who you are. And lastly, God, would you make me a person of sustained growth that if you see fit to lead me through some truly terrible storms, which I see in your word, you often lead your followers through. Would you simply make me the kind of person that holds on to you, that keeps digging my roots into the stream of your word so that even when it's painful, I would grow through it and become the person that you desire me to be and I desire to be on the other side of those storms. That's, a, that's just a sample, kind of simple idea of what a meditation on Psalm 1 could be. You notice all of that is based on what God has said here. None of that is wishful thinking. And the promise of Psalm 1 is that if you incorporate that into your life, it is, it's just a matter of time before it bears fruit. And that leads me to, the, to the, the last aspect of what we see in the practice of meditation, which is when we do it. And again, it's clear as day. The psalmist says you do this day and night. You meditate on it day and night. And I don't think the idea there is just do it a lot. I don't think that's what that means. Although, of course, it's not less than that. I think what the psalmist is getting across here is this idea that you and I need to incorporate the discipline of meditation needs to become such an integral part of the rhythm of our lives that it's just as natural to us as lying down and rising again. That as naturally as we go to bed and wake up, it's, it's that natural for us to meditate 
on the law of the Lord. And the reason that it's so important we do this day and night is because this is not an overnight process. You know how long it takes for a tree to dig its roots into a stream? You know how long it takes for a tree to bear fruit? And so I'm, I'm saying this to somebody, you know, tomorrow morning or a week from now or whenever you find yourself listening to this person in the future listening to me right now, uh, you should expect there to be times where you do this and you feel like absolutely nothing happened. Where, where you do everything right and you incorporate everything from Psalm 1 and you do the whole what should this look like and it just feels dry and it feels like, am I not doing it right? We should expect times like that. It's not going to be the day of Pentecost every time we spend time with God. But the point is there's growth even when we can't see it. There's growth in the soil. There's growth, there's growth underneath the bark. And if we dig in and we make this an integral part of our life, it's going to change our lives. And that's not my opinion. That's God's promise in Psalm chapter 1. Amen? Now, the last idea that I, that I want to cover today, we've talked about the, the promise of meditation, the principle of it, the practice of it. Now, lastly, the fourth P is the puzzle of meditation. And there is a puzzle here if you pay careful enough attention to what this is saying. In verse 2, it says, instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, or your version probably says the law of the Lord, same thing, and he meditates on it day and night. To me, that's a really, it's a puzzling verse. And the reason I say that is because the law, when you talk about the law of the Lord, what the law of the Lord does fundamentally, the law of the Lord is like an x-ray or an MRI. The law of the Lord is going to show you everything that's wrong with you. Uh, the law of the Lord is going to show you every area of your life that you continue to fall infinitely short of God's standard. Uh, that's why Paul actually said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, that the law kills it's the spirit that gives life. So here's the puzzle that Psalm 1 leaves you and I with. How is it that somebody could meditate on the law of God, the thing which only reveals all their flaws, and somehow find themselves getting happier? What kind of, what, what kind of person would be able to do that? You know, you're, you're talking about somebody who first off would have to be wholly committed and submitted to God, yet somebody who is so perfect that they weren't condemned by God, that they could pass final scrutiny. Now, there's only one person in the whole of existence that's actually like that. You've probably heard of him before. We tend to talk about him a lot at this church. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. I like, I like the, you know, the response you guys give me when you just say, like there's a Jesus Christ and people are like, ooh, okay. Like there's something that happens there. I love like the end. It's always the same. You know, I heard, a pastor told me one time, somebody wrote him a little bit of hate mail and said, hey, you're an okay preacher, but all your sermons end the same way. You just talk about Jesus. His response was, fire me if the ending is ever different. You know, love your pastor kind of thing. Um, the answer is Jesus here. You know, what you see in the gospel accounts is that Jesus is the one who perfectly embodied everything that we're talking about here. He meditated on the law of the Lord day and night and was so saturated with it that, that everything he thought, everything he said, everything he did, his response to every situation was just an outworking of his meditation on the law of the Lord. Even when Jesus was on the cross and he called out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's just Jesus quoting scripture, ironically, from the Psalter itself. So what you see in Jesus is the embodiment of what it would look like if somebody perfectly meditated on and perfectly lived out all of the implications of the law of the Lord. That's why scripture actually says Jesus is the word of God made flesh. If you want to know what it looks like to perfectly meditate on the law of the Lord and live out of that, look no further than Jesus. But in hearing that, that really doesn't help you and it doesn't help me. And maybe you find yourself asking, that's great, that's Jesus. I know that he's perfect. I'm not. So how does Jesus solve this puzzle of how I'm supposed to meditate on that which only reveals to me how broken I am while at the same time allowing me to get happier and holier? How does Jesus do that? And you see a really clear answer to that in a very specific exchange Jesus had with a woman by a well. In John chapter 4, Jesus met up with a Samaritan woman, came to the well during the hottest part of the day, which said a lot about exactly how broken she was, and, and to paraphrase Jesus, he spoke to her and he said, how amazing would it be if you had access to water that would never leave you thirsty again? That is such a significant question for that woman's life. Because as you go on to find out, you find out this woman does what we all have a tendency to do. This woman had lived her entire life trying to send the roots 
of her heart into something other than God, and it had left her dry and weary and broken and full of shame and isolated. Jesus said, what if there was water that would leave you, that would quench your thirst forever? And the woman asks for that water, and Jesus looks at her and says, I am that water. Can you imagine what that was like? I am living water that, that'll lead to everlasting life, is what Jesus told that woman that day. And the question is, how could Jesus offer something like that to a woman who was that broken? And how could he offer something like that to you and I today? And the answer comes, as it so often does, right at the cross. Because at the cross, what we see is the same Savior who offered us water that would ensure we never thirsted again. We see that same Savior calling out with the phrase, I thirst. And don't miss the significance of that because when Jesus called out, he's talking about something far more than the physical absence of water. He's talking about a spiritual condition. What happened in that moment as Jesus hung on the cross for us is he was experiencing he was experiencing spiritual dryness, spiritual thirst. He was experiencing what it is to be cut off from these streams of living water that were promised here in Psalm chapter 1 because as he hung on that cross, he was experiencing what you and I sense in our hearts we deserve the longer that we look into the law of the Lord. And as we meditate on what Jesus has done for us and all that it means for us, that he lived the life we couldn't live and he took our place and he took our shame and he took our guilt and he rose again for our victory and we meditate on the truth of the gospel that in Jesus we are so much more sinful than we dare believe, but we are so much more loved than we would ever dare hope. What happens as we do that is, is we become so transformed, so, so much more like Christ that we actually begin to delight in the law of the Lord. And it goes from, from being something that, that we actually desire to do, it, not, not that we have to do, but something we desire to do, not in order to get God to love us, but in response to the love freely poured out on us by grace through faith in the name of Jesus. Now, you, you, you probably heard me quote this before, but John Newton could not have said this better in a hymn. He said, to see the law by Christ fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice transforms a slave into a child and duty into choice. That's what it's all about. You meditate on the person who was the word of God made flesh, and as we do that, it transforms us from the inside out. Let me call the worship team up. We're going to close today. While Jesus was here, <clears throat> he was speaking to religious leaders that know the Old Testament probably better than you and I ever will. I think this is one of the, the most interesting statements Jesus made. It tells us a lot about how we should approach Scripture. He, he said to them, he said, you pour over the Scriptures because you think that you'll find eternal life in them. Jesus said, yet those Scriptures that you pour, you pour over, Jesus said, every single one of them is testifying about me. And in, in, in Jesus' day, the people that he originally delivered that to, that was actually a rebuke to them, but that should be incredibly encouraging to us. Because what that means for us today is that every, and I'll make this personal for you, what this means for you today is that every single time you open up God's word, what you are actually presented with is a pathway to the feet of Jesus. That if you walk, if you stay on and you walk long enough, it will reveal to you an aspect, a facet of the man who was God in a unique way that will, that will have you transformed. That's what, we, that's what we're presented with every single time we open the Word of God. And so if we train our hearts to meditate on the Word of God until we, we come face to face with the person who was the Word of God made flesh, Jesus Christ, the promise that we have is that in doing that over the span of the short time that God's given us here, we will be transformed into people of substance, into people of stability, and the people of sustained growth, like trees planted by a life-giving stream. That is unequivocally, that is our Father's heart for us. And so now, and this is the heart of this series, it's up to you and I to go and do it. This is the discipline of meditation. That's it. That's all. Let me pray for us. Father God, you have given us everything that we need to be transformed in ways that we wouldn't imagine. And I, I, I just want to ask specifically over these next 12 weeks or so that as we look at these disciplines that you've made available to us in your word, that we would take them seriously and we would incorporate them into our lives so that the image of your son Jesus would be formed more clearly in us. There is no greater calling that we have between now and the moment that our final breath escapes 
than to become more like Jesus, to bring you as much glory as we possibly can. In the name of the risen Son of God, we ask these things. Amen.